marhaban wa ahlan bikum fi barnamij dakhil Washington. Ma'akum mudifakum, Robert Satloff. America fi halat harb min jadid. Lem yamdi wakt tawil, mundu an a'lana al rais Obama an inhisar mad al harb fi shark al awsat. Wa fi am al fain wa itnashar, faza bahamlat intakhabiya ta asasad ala fikra. بناء الأمة على أرض الوطن ولكن في مواجهة سورة دايش أو الدولة الإسلامية وتناميها وهجمياتها تحدث الرئيس إلا الأمة في ذكرى هجمات 11 سبتمبر ليشرح السبب وراء كون أمريكا مجددا في حالة حرب مع المتطرفين الإسلاميين الأصوليين ما هي الاستراتيجية الأمريكية؟ كيف يختلف هذا الجهد عن الحملات العسكرية الأمريكية السابقة في الشرق الأوسط؟ حرب أم 1990 لإجلاء العراق عن الكويت وحرب أم 2001 ضد القائدة والطالبان وحرب أم 2003 ضد السدام ما هو الهدف؟ وكيف سنوها كيكه؟ هل ستكون للحرب الطويلة دود الجهاديين نهاية أبدا؟ لتناول هذه الأسئلة الهامة يسدني أن أراهب من جديد بلجنتنا المكونة من خبيري السياسة الخارجية دينيس روس ووان تراتي Welcome back to Dachl Washington. I'm sitting here with my foreign policy experts, Juan Zarati and Dennis Ross. Gentlemen, after having declared not too long ago that he didn't have a strategy to confront uh, ISIS, or as is known in the Middle East, Daesh, uh, the president just announced a major new national commitment to degrade and ultimately defeat this radical jihadist organization. What happened? Why did the president embrace this as a new national commitment? And how did he define a strategy so expeditiously? Dennis? Well, I think two things happened. I think first, the reaction to saying we don't have a strategy was sort of universally negative, And I think that produced an increased degree of pressure to make it clear we know what we're doing, number one. Number two, I think there was an, an understanding, look, this is a, a problem, we have to deal with it. What created the hesitancy in the first place is still, I think, one of the issues that will continue to challenge the administration, and that is what to do in Syria. It's clear that we have to do something in Iraq, and we had already begun to do that. In Syria, it's also clear you can't have a strategy for dealing with ISIL and trying to eradicate it in Iraq if you don't have a strategy for what you're going to do in Syria. You cannot leave ISIL with a place where it has not just a safe haven, but essentially establishes itself as a state. If you look at Raqqa, it actually is functioning as a state already. So I think that the challenge of Syria was what gave the president pause to begin with because that has bedeviled him for the last couple of years. He came to understand there is no way to deal with ISIL unless you're dealing with, dealing with it in Syria as well. So we see a declaration that we're going to seriously ramp up now the assistance to the opposition there. We're going to at least make it clear that there are targets in Syria that we're going to go after as well. But we heard in that speech, which I think on the whole was a, an effective speech, I think what we heard was uh, a sense of direction, but still not any specificity exactly on how we're going to do what we're going to do in Syria. Juan, why did the president now embrace this as yeah. a new national commitment? Well, I, I think there were, Dennis is absolutely right. There were some other factors at play. The, the beheading videos, the two American journalists who were killed by this group brutally, uh, really sensitized the American public, not just to the brutality of the group, but to the threat uh, that it poses to America. And that started to change and has changed public opinion. And so the White House, I think, in some ways felt more comfortable uh, being more forceful, and in fact, there were some public demands for the president to be more forceful. Second, we were already uh, beginning uh, the elements of a more forceful strategy. Uh, the airstrikes to help the Yazidis on Mount Sh uh, Shinjar, uh, the uh, placement of American troops uh, to help in Erbil. 
uh, we were already beginning to mobilize in a different way. And so the president, in some ways, already had to explain this. Um, third, I think there, there was a growing chorus, certainly in Washington, of the growing threat, not just regionally, but globally from this group. The inspiration that this group uh, means to the global jihadi movement, the threats potentially to the homeland. His own cabinet secretary is talking about the real risk and threat to American interest. And so all of that, I think, in combination uh, had, has led a reluctant president who has not wanted to engage in further war in the Middle East uh, to actually declare war without using that term uh, against this group. So what does it mean in an administration? And you both served in these administrations, and in a moment I'll ask you to hearken back to specifics, but more generally, what does it mean in an administration when a president defines such a national commitment our nation will now um, uh, embrace the goal of destroying this organization. Does everything else get thrown aside? What, how does it change the normal order of business? Well, it certainly becomes a priority, especially when the president comes out and makes this such a declarative a central policy, especially for the Middle East. This now starts to take up the oxygen in the room. Um, it doesn't mean other issues aren't important. It doesn't mean issues in Asia or Latin America or other issues in South and Central Asia aren't attended to. But it does mean there has to be an intensity of focus. This is in part why you now see the administration naming General John Allen to be the point person on this issue, to give focus in the region. You're going to see intensity of meetings in, in the White House. There's going to be a lot of media attention. How are we doing? Uh, where are the battle lines shifting? Uh, how are the ground forces, the proxy forces on the ground doing? How many airstrikes today? This is the kind of focus that it brings, and it begins to take up the oxygen in the room, not just uh, in, the, in the situation room, but across the board on American foreign policy. Dennis? You know, I think it's, it's an excellent question, uh, and everything that Juan has said I think is right. It creates a kind of defining moment for an administration. So now you have a focal point, and everything is going to be, in a sense, driven by that focal point. And yet I find myself feeling that somehow the level of the rhetoric is not entirely matched by the character of the action that we see, in fact, being employed. One example, if, in fact, this is such a defining issue for us and it's going to drive us, why are we talking about the same amount of money for the Syrian opposition that we were talking about in June. I mean, if this is that critical an element for us and everything else needs, in a sense, to be maybe important but is still somehow derivative, you would look, it seems to me, to a level of other actions that would suggest that something qualitatively has changed. And I'm not sure we've seen that qualitative change yet, and that's why I, I feel we may still not be at that point where we were say in 1990, uh, if we want to look at historical well, examples. Well, actually, I want to ask both of you about historical examples that uh, from each of your uh, experiences. Dennis, 1990, um, the first George Bush's um, re response to Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, and one, uh, the second George Bush's response to 9-11 in 2001, just 13 years ago as we speak. Uh, Dennis? Well, look, in 1990, you had Iraq basically go and take Kuwait, uh, which put Iraq in a position of potentially unbelievable leverage over the supply of oil. I mean, the basic question of who has leverage and, uh, and a, an American objective has always been not to allow a hostile power to gain leverage over the, the flow of oil out of the Middle East. So this, in fact, at the time, in fact, we, the Bush administration, defined it as a defining moment. Uh, so this really was the issue that, that consumed, to use Juan's term, all the oxygen. And everything the administration was doing from that point on was geared towards how we were going to reverse it. Four days after it took place, the president said, this will not stand. Uh, and once he said, this will not stand, that was the objective, and everything was geared towards ensuring that that objective was going to be achieved. So I was with Secretary Baker as we made multiple trips around the world to organize a coalition first to establish everybody being in the same place with regard to sanctions, then to move from what was a kind of sanctions deterrent posture to a defensive posture to what could be an offensive posture and to create 
a resolution in the, in the Security Council for all necessary, the use of all necessary means to reverse this. So it was something that drove the administration and the behavior, of, in a sense, of everybody in it. Well, well, I, I think 9-11 was a defining moment for the country, and, and obviously the, the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration. I think what was uh, so critical at that moment was obviously the, the country focused on the threat uh, as it, it manifested in New York and in Shanksville and in, at the Pentagon. Uh, but it was a shift that the Bush administration gave to restructuring how we thought about the threat and how we dealt with national security in two regards. One. The president was very clear that we were going on a war footing, that we were going to use all elements of national power to not only defend our interests, but to offensively go after this threat. And at the time, keep in mind that there was grave concern about attacks and threats to come. The U.S. felt very blind to what was, what was happening. Secondly, it led to a much more aggressive national security principle of uh, preemption and prevention, uh, that we would never again be in a position where we would allow threats to fester and then to threaten the homeland and U.S. interests. And that then led to the Iraq uh, war debate uh, and other principles that have been so uh, hotly debated since. But it was really those two formulations, that the idea that we are going to go to war, and that means use of troops, use of intelligence, use of financial resources, use, use of diplomacy in all its forms against this threat, and we are going to use our power preemptively uh, and that really was a defining moment, not just for the administration, but for how we thought about our foreign policy. And in many ways, we're still dealing uh, with that shift uh, 13 years later. Okay, when we come back, we're going to talk about what it means for an administration to go to war and what it means for an administration to promise that this war is going to last until the next administration in just a moment. And again, my panelists are Juan Zarate. Juan is a senior advisor to the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the senior national security consultant and analyst for CBS News, one of our nation's leading counterterrorism and national security experts. He served in the administration of President George W. Bush as deputy national security advisor and assistant to the president, an attorney by training he was the first ever Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for terrorist financing and financial crimes. His experience is chronicled in his fine new book, Treasury's War, The Unleashing of a New Era of Financial Warfare. Sitting next to Juan is my colleague Dennis Ross, counselor to the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, which he rejoined after three years in the Obama administration, first in the State Department and then as Senior Director for the Central Region on the staff of the National Security Council. Dennis has a quarter century experience at high levels of government, including White House tours in the Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administrations, and service as the President's Special Envoy for Middle East Peace. Now, gentlemen, most administrations are not set up to be war presidencies. The people aren't chosen for this, but sometimes that responsibility is thrust upon them. So what happens? What if you don't have the right people? What if you don't have the right team and the right setup? How are presidents able and can they, what do they need to do to create an effective war administration? Dennis? You know, I think one of the keys for a president is to look at what the requirements are and then look at what he has and who he has in his administration and then make a judgment. If you go back to the George H.W. Bush administration, they, we didn't bring new people in. He had a very tightly knit team. And not only did that tightly knit team at the principal's level work, but at the level just below it. It was the same thing. We had informal networks that worked as much as the formal structures of, in, of the interagency process. So you didn't see new people brought in. I would say in this administration, if you look at the Obama administration, Obviously, right now, the president is looking at something that he didn't expect that he was going to have to face. And he has to ask himself the question, all right, does the structure that exists serve the needs that I've now identified? The fact that he's brought General John Allen in to, to be 
in a sense, the person in charge of this military operation says that he recognized that the structure that he had wasn't sufficient to meet what is the nature of the challenge. Whether he will bring someone additional in on what I'll call the non-military side of the house remains to be seen. I wouldn't be totally surprised to see something like that because the character of what he's facing, as I said, was not something that he anticipated that he would be facing. Becoming a war presidency. Well, I, I think there's a psychological dimension to it, right? President George W. Bush didn't anticipate 9-11 right. uh, transforming his administration the way it was. He was at a school the morning of 9-11. He was focused on education reform, tax reform, et cetera. Um, and he had to become a war president. And so, as you said, I don't think uh, presidents come in prepared necessarily to go to war. Uh, but I think one of the things you saw post 9-11 um, in addition to having sort of the right people around the president, you had a major bureaucratic shift over time in the United States uh, counterterrorism structure. And so you had the creation of very large institutions, the new Department of Homeland Security in 2003, which brought together 22 agencies and departments from around the, the government to worry about entry of goods and people into the country. The creation of the National Counterterrorism Center, which was the focal point for counterterrorism analysis and strategic operational planning. Uh, creation of new offices throughout the government to focus on this problem and to give it not just political attention, but actual resources and expertise to bring to bear. And so uh, often what you have to do in a major shift, and this isn't the case now, I think, with the Obama administration, but is think through the bureaucratics and the personnel at the working level that you need to then implement and execute the strategy. Can I just add yes, one please. thing to that? In, a, in many respects, the structure that was created in the aftermath of that in the Bush administration has been inherited by the Obama administration. You look at terrorist financing, you look at how we, we carry out sanctions, all that was a function of the structure that was created at that time. In the special operations yes. community. And uh, exactly. So a lot of the a lot of the intelligence reforms that were made no, no, in no small part as a result of 9-11, have carried over and are now built in to this administration. So here's an interesting example where continuity to deal with what was a kind of war, even if this administration was saying we're not engaged in the war on terror, all those structural elements were maintained and in some ways they've been refined and improved upon. So that I don't think is what is necessary for this administration, but I do think from a personnel standpoint, and the President's already recognized that, as I said, by bringing General Allen into it, I wonder whether or not we may see some new people also, as I said, in the non-military side of the House. Mm -hmm. Rob, just one quick point. You may have noticed in the President's speech his unwillingness to use the lexicon of war, right? right? He was talking about airstrikes, he was talking about campaigns, he used the word fight, but he compared it to the wars of Iraq and Afghanistan. So this president still is a reluctant war leader, um, and that has consequences. I was in debates in the Situation Room, literally with the president, where we had debates president over Bush. President Bush over the lexicon. What language do we apply to this fight? Is it a fight against violent extremism? Is it a war? The president was explicit, actually act angry at times, to say, we are at war. It's important for the American public to understand it. It is relevant because of the authorities that we have to bring to bear and the resources. And if we're putting men and women in harm's way to fight this war, we need to call it what it is. And we're not seeing that here. And I think that lends itself to Although, what Dennis was saying, the reluctance of this well, president. Specifically, the president has said that he was operating under the original 9-11 right. uh, um, uh, authorization for the use of force. Right. Do you think that flies? not just legally, but uh, to pass the smell test in the, uh, in the noses of the American people, as it were. Well, I, I make two points. The first point is it's very clear that he's trying to maintain a limit here. He's trying to contain the scope of what we will do. And he doesn't want to go down a, a path that leads him, in his mind, down a slippery slope. And that's been part of the hesitancy all along. There's no question about that. The second point, though, is that I think even many of his closest allies on the Hill are not prepared to go that route. You look at someone like Tim Kaine. He is insisting... The senator from Virginia. That's right. A Democratic senator from Virginia who has been a very strong supporter of the president, but he's making it very clear, look, it's one thing for us to go ahead and vote the $500 million, and that I think the president will get support for very quickly. But if you want to begin to carry out strikes in Syria, you need a different set of authorities to be able to do that. 
And that's coming from leading Democrats, not just Republicans. Uh, and I think conceptually it's hard, maybe for the American public, but certainly here in Washington, because the president had not only talked about constraining the extent of the AUMF, but actually ending it. Keep in mind in one of his prior counterterrorism speeches, his aspiration was ultimately, as part of his theme of ending wars, to see the ending of the need for an AUMF. And now, in many ways, he's interpreting it, or his administration is, very broadly yeah, right. uh, and in a way that will be handed over to a new administration. A real stark change from where he was. Well, we're going to uh, have an opportunity to discuss all that because this issue is going to be with us at least through the next presidential election. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Look forward to having you back next month. Thank you. Bahava Nasilu Ilanahayat Hadahil Halka in Baranamaj Dakil Washington. If the Kenneth Ladekum E is Taf Sarat or Ta'ali Kat, Hawal Hadahil Halka, Wa Khasatan Hawal Harb America Dud Daesh, Arjuan to Tasalubi Mubasharatan, Allah Anwan or Barid Electroni Itali, Inside Washington at Elhura.com. Ma Kum Robert Satloff, Shukran Lakum, Wa Ilalaka.